The Isolated Dinosaur Archipelago Expedition Question and Observation What kind of flora and fauna live on the islands of Primeval? Research Topic Primeval is the colloquial name given to the alternate dimension version of Earth that can be reached via boat, five kilometers southeast of the outpost hotel of Isle City. Knowledge of the wormhole connecting Earth and Primeval evil at this time is very limited, but it has been stable for over 750,000 years, so it is unlikely to collapse anytime soon. Despite humanity's contact with primeval for thousands of years, knowledge of the flora and fauna are mostly in the forms of legends and myths. What we do understand is that primeval has more oxygen and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than it does on Earth leading to temperature averages that are 5 to 10 degrees warmer, far more extreme weather than is seen on Earth, larger arthropods, large avians, large reptile life, and even entire biomes where mammalian life cannot survive at all due to reaching the wet bulb point. This has led primeval to boast diverse biomes that support life that resembles life on Earth from tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of years ago. Whether this is evidence of divergent evolution from Earth's stock from millions of years ago, or is of convergent evolution due to similar environment, is still unknown at, as of this time. Mammalian life, though rare, does exist on primeval, but primarily in the form of small egg-laying rodents found on every explored landmass, pouch-bearing felines that live on the islands hunting the rodents, and the oddest of all are bipedal primate anthromorphs that closely resemble Homo sapiens sapiens, Homo sapiens neanderthalis, Homo erectus, and unknown subspecies of human. Genetic testing has yet to find the difference between humans and primeval uh, anthromorphs, despite the apparent different origins of species. Plant life on primeval has also proven to resemble plant life in prehistoric times, but preliminary testing has shown many to have a beneficial effect to human biology. None of the plant life has survived outside of primeval except in laboratory conditions. The elevated oxygen levels have also proven to be toxic to all known terrestrial plant life, most microbes, and even dangerous to humans who are not acclimated can perish from oxygen poisoning, hyperoxia, and other related disorders. Additional exploration of primeval offers a plethora of study opportunities and numerous possible sources of income for the Mad Scientist Union. It is theorized that the consistent high oxygen content will lead to sources of oil, coal, peat, that has yet to be tapped into, with competition for resources being minimal to non-existent. Already, investors from Isaacs Industries, Madrigal Inc., Agamemnon's Academy, and other companies have shown interest in obtaining fossil fuels from primeval at a much lower rate than those set by the League of Nations. Other possible resources include lumber from untouched trees that dwarf even the largest redwoods, wild fishing from species that have never known the corruption of mercury or pollution, and precious metals that have never even been touched by humans have already been obtained by the ton from the corpses of prime mevalites. Tourism has been estimated to be a multi-million centi industry for Isle City, just for day trips to Primeval. If we set up functional base, resort, or similar infrastructure within Primeval, then hundreds of millions or even billions of centi can be raised to help fund the research of Primeval. Hypothesis. The flora and fauna within Primeval are expected to closely resemble extinct saurian creatures with thousands of new species and subspecies yet to be discovered. Test or experiment. By taking the research vessel, RV Mary Anning, through the portal to Primeval with the standard team of 10, I intend to explore the nearby archipelago codenamed Ida, IDA, 
first by surveying from the ocean for initial mapping, before making landfall and setting a base camp on Isle Sigma, which possesses no lar known large predators and no primevolites. From there, we plan on surveying the local wi wildlife, possible resources, and further locations for infrastructure. Experimentation has been approved. Initial Exploration Kin 1 The portal to Primeval was strange, in a word. Even knowing how it worked, it was disturbing. We sailed southeast of Isle City's Outpost 13 and made it to a large gray rock the size of an island. No shore, and even the seabirds didn't try to land on it. This is theorized due to the, fa due to the fact that primevolite predators could eat them if they get too close. On the northern part of the gray rock was a cave, about 20 meters tall, 20 meters deep, and 30 meters side to side. So, not very large, but the most disturbing part of the cave? The entrance was carved by an unknown human group thousands of years ago that was made to resemble the skull of a saurian predator. The teeth were smooth and pale and covered in algae, in sharp contrast to the gray sterile stone of the isle. When we passed between the front teeth, with the space being just enough to allow the ship to go through, the entire crew, myself included, felt a cold chill sweep through us as we saw the inside of the cave. It was a large chamber that looked larger than the island itself, and on the far end of the chamber was an exit showing a clear blue sky. An exit that wasn't visible on the outside. The period of time that it's safe to enter Primeval is only for about mm, two hours, twice a day. The esoteric community calls it the pathos of the Primeval Path. Based on legend, there was an exodus from our world to Primeval, so the black moon showed the path to primeval through the teeth of a feathered serpent. But the ocean was too short in those days for anyone to reach the dragon's mouth. But enough people cried at the serpent's mouth to fill the oceans, allowing the water to rise over the bottom teeth, allowing people to escape through the serpent's mouth to emerge into primeval. But the people kept crying, this time in happiness as they came through. And then they filled the ocean too much. So that the ocean then reached the top teeth of the serpent, sealing the way off again without getting cut to pieces. But the Silver Moon, in her mercy on humanity, decided to create the tides to give the people a few hours in the day and a few hours at night to allow safe passage from a dying world. Obviously, this is a myth, but what the myth does get right is that the tides only allow for a few hours of safe passage through the jaws. When the tide is too low, the bottom teeth will cut any ship that tries to get through. When the tide is too high, the top teeth will touch the water, cutting any ships that try to get through, only allowing a few hours in the Goldilocks zone. This has prevented most major expeditions into Primeval, but there had been enough explorers to prepare the crew for what was going to occur. As we entered the cave, we turned off all electronics on the ship, including the ship's engine, and let the current pull us towards the center of the cave. Here, the gray-blue of Earth's Oceanus intermingled with the crystal-clear blue of Primeval's Kukulkan. Emerging from the cave on the other side, we made it to the bright side of Primeval. Any technology that relied on electricity had to be turned off while going through the wormhole. Otherwise, the effect would be similar to a high-altitude electromagnetic pulse, or HEMP, creating high-voltage damage and rendering all of our equipment useless. Even things like flashlights and cameras couldn't have batteries inside until we made it to the primevolite side. And despite our best efforts, we still didn't understand why it shorted out electronics. 
We knew for sure it wasn't an actual EMP because both Faraday shielding and lead shielding didn't work. Hence why we had to use such primitive means of preserving our tech, leaving as much of it disassembled as possible on Earth's side before making it to primeval. And where on Earth's side it was 3 a.m. in the morning, here on primeval it was an hour before solar noon. Now through to on primeval we had to adjust to some new terms. The single star in the sky named Kanich after the Mayan god of the sun was slightly different from Sol. A bit brighter that encouraged all of the crew to wear sunglasses and SPF 70 protection. And here the days were also a bit shorter. Only a 23 hour cycle and instead of referring to them as days, which would be confusing, it was just easier to refer to them as kins. The most disturbing part of the local cosmology, though, were the stars and the moon. Namely, the fact that despite there being a tide equal to that on Earth, there was no moon on primeval, and the stars were few and far between. Per local mythology, Primeval was still a young world, and the gods were waiting for more heroes to rise before creating a moon and new stars. The working theory from the MSU was that Primeval was in a young galaxy in a void of the universe. However, whether Primeval is a completely different dimension or just a different part of our universe is still hotly debated. Through the island, we turned on all of our electronics again and began to make our way to Ida. Communication with Earth is non-existent on this side. Exoteric radio signals, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, cellular signals all failed to get through the wormhole. For all intents and purposes, we were on our own here, unless we wanted to send a message through the bottle. We made it to Ida without issue and mapped the outside of the archipelago. The waters here were, thankfully, relatively shadow. Only 50 meters deep, so we can view the bottom of the sandy sea. 50 meters may not feel that shallow to most people, but the Kukulkan Sea was filled with super predators that were large enough to sink the Mary Anning, or even large enough to bite into the steel, leaving a gaping hole and the crew on the bottom of the sea. But thankfully these dangerous creatures didn't enjoy the shallow waters. There just wasn't enough prey to sustain them. Not to say that there wasn't fascinating fauna around the archipelago. We found coral reefs flourishing in odd colors of green, orange, pink, and oddly enough, even red and black. Samson, our resident marine paleontologist and biologist, spent hours taking pictures of the coral and the life that lived in it. At first glance, the fish and anemones resembled what was on Earth, but closer examination showed that they had different eyes, teeth, fin shapes, and occasionally even different scales. But by the time we moved on from the coral reef, Samson went back to his cabin to examine all the pictures he took and made notes while we paused just outside of Isle Sigma for the night. Knitch is setting, and to adjust to the new time zone, we all head to sleep to prepare for the next kin. Kin 2. I woke up early today, and when I went to the side to see the sea life, I saw something unusual. In the dim water, there was glowing. There was actually more light in the ocean than there was in the sky above. Viewing the ocean through my binoculars, I can see that the Kukulkan is full of jellyfish. Their stingers drifted after the bell for about 2 meters, while their bells were only maybe about 20 centimeters. I didn't think about it until now, but it made sense for jellyfish to exist here on Primeval. They're very adaptable beings that survived every extinction event in Earth's history. 
it makes sense that they would thrive on primeval also. Still, though, it's odd that there is such a bloom right before we're supposed to make our way to shore. So, taking a net and a bottle, I take a few samples along with the water in the ocean to provide to Samson for examination. A few hours later, Samson proved the jellyfish were harmless. They didn't possess any venom, and these species appeared to be filter feeders, feeding on the local plankton and equivalent to krill, which live in abundance in the water. He is pleased with the results of the water and wants to continue his study. So, Samson will continue to wait on the RV Mary Anning, studying his jellies, while the rest of the crew make it to shore. The beach is odd to us, who are used to the beaches of Vespucci. The sand on Vespucci tends to be very fine and small, with very few shells, and tends to be lots of glass. But the sand here on Primeval is, for all intents and purposes, just a bunch of smooth pebbles in various shades of gray, white, and lots of the pebbles themselves are filled with small shells and even teeth. Enoch, our geologist, was quite interested in the sand, filling up five different sample bags before she finally stopped. While I didn't understand everything she was saying, I did understand that a lot of the sand was limestone with stones from the deep brought up along with the shells and bone fragments. When we made it just past the tidal line, where the brown-red kelp marked the line, we found some truly large teeth. It reminded me at first of those trips I used to take at the museum, where we would take kids to try to find great white teeth on the beach. Those teeth were practically puny compared to the ones we found here. A lot of the teeth here resembled fossilized megalodon teeth, except they still had the coat of white on the outside, and they were far too large to wear as a necklace charm, unless the necklace was made of iron chains. And the strangest part? The megalodon teeth weren't even close to the biggest teeth on the beach. There were also teeth that were larger than I was tall, and so wide that if I hugged it, my hands wouldn't have made it halfway around the tooth. A quick count of the teeth, I could see that there was hundreds of megalodon teeth. The tourist value of those teeth alone had already made the expedition worthwhile. Kenan and Enos were directed to gather megalodon teeth and bring them back to the RV he Mary Anning, while the rest of us made our way to the interior of the aisle. Results of the initial exploration have already proven that Primeval is prime with capital. The reefs here are unique and can prove a great place for tourists to observe. We have cataloged over 100 new species in less than 48 hours of being in Primeval. The beach of Isle Sigma has already proven to be a source of valuable teeth. Our initial teeth samples have been valued at approximately 17 million quatchly. Geological survey of the sand has also proven large sources of gold, silver, and uranium exist within the local ocean at an, as of now, unknown location. The expedition. Kin to continued. The beach had a path carved deep into the interior already. At first, we thought it was a wild path, but with the steps carved in, the rocks at the edge of the path, and regular carvings into the trunks of the trees, we have concluded this path was made by the local Primevolite tribe. The Primevolites were physically and biologically identical to humans, but they weren't seen here. Even on our path, our botanist, Sarah, had taken numerous leaf samples and flower samples. She's very eager because despite looking superficially primitive, the plants here have almost no resemblance to our ancient plant life. Hopefully these strange ferns and cone-shaped flowers have attributes that can be useful. Sarah has trouble focusing on what will give our expedition the most grants. 
plants don't exactly draw the same kind of attention as precious metals, dinosaurs, or deep sea life. After a few hours, he made it to the center of the island. Here, there was a settlement. It was built in a circle, and the outermost edge was marked with bricks, making the circle complete. And then we passed a line of large stakes pointing out towards the jungle behind us. And then we, and we passed the stakes, we made it to our first set of buildings. Short, single-story structures made of the gr strange gray stone with a round, almost bowl-shaped roof that we guessed were made to be the homes of the Primevalites. Then, when we passed the homes, there were large ponds of water. They were full of fish and plant life, which reminded me of the floating garlands in Tenochtitlan, except for the fact that there were no people around to take care of the gardens and the fish. The center of the settlement was a large fire pit, at least five meters across, full of soot that was surrounded by a large wooden structure, which didn't serve any purpose as far as we can see. It was almost like a guardrail, but it was six meters tall. Sarah said it reminded her of a perch that she had for her pet bird back earthside. This was immediately dismissed. No bird species grew that large on primeval, and there were no birds on Isle Sigma anyways. This, however, has proven to be a great place to set up base camp. It's not far from the beach, it took us a few hours to get here because we were cataloging every plant, and it's not far from anywhere else on Isle Sigma. It also has the benefits of having paths to the other parts of the island. Rebecca, our geological surveyor, has traveled to the northern part of the island and surveyed the ground there. I don't understand the equipment she used, but according to her, there is surface coal less than 50 meters underground. While the amount is unknown, it is likely to be quite extensive. So that is going to be worth even more to us now. The League of Nations on Earth has outlawed both nations and corporations from laying claim to territory in worlds that are not of Earth. This was created out of the interest of maintaining independence and fair trade between all of the worlds that make up all that is. There were, however, exceptions made for scientific research allowed in other worlds, but that still created a stranglehold on the local economy. An entire world of untapped resources exists out here on Primeval. Fair trade with the Primevalites have left us at a disadvantage and not making as much as we could be making when the Primevalites even bother selling something that we want. We can't purchase coal, steel, or even oil from them, but we need those materials now more than we have ever before. So, we have proven to our corporate backers that we can obtain these resources from them, and the Mad Scientist Union still counts as a scientific group, so we can get these resources for cheap and Major Goal Inc. and Isaacs Industries can keep funding us. A glorious little exchange. Tonight we will make camp in the settlement, and tomorrow we will make our way back to the ship. We have found enough that the experiment is profitable. Kin 3. It was a mistake. It was a mistake to set up base camp in the settlement. Okay, starting from the beginning. We all found a building to stay in for the night. It was relaxing, and it hid the creepy, starless night. But I was woken up that night by a loud thud on the roof. Grabbing my flashlight and my sidearm, I left my structure, and all my men did the same thing. It was foggy late at night. No starlight, no moonlight, and no fire and the only thing we could see was the wooden structure that looked like trees in the fog. And all the men were just as confused as I was while we looked around. And then suddenly, there was screaming as Enoch was plucked from the ground by 
with something in the fog and lifted into the darkness. His scream was cut off short. While we were all trying to figure out what was happening, there was another scream as Rebecca was taken. This time though, I got a flash of the feathered neck and the long beak and those soulless yellow eyes. What the hell was that? I yelled as another beak came down, just grazing my arm but almost hitting me. This time I could get a better look at it. It reminded me of a creature mentioned during my time as a paleontologist when I would do presentations for all those kids. Quetzalcoatlus! I screamed and pulling out my sidearm to fire wildly into the dark fog. A loud screech was heard and a furious flap of wings as the fog parted and showed us what was happening. The settlement wasn't just a settlement for primevolites. There was a reason they weren't here right now and that they were somewhere else. The settlement was a, built to be a nest for the Quetzalcoatlus when they weren't there. The homes were perfectly built to be nests for the flying reptiles' eggs. The structure that Sarah said looked like a perch was indeed a perch for them. And the floating gardens were supplying fish and water for them to eat. The Quetzalcoatlus were all crouched on all fours. Their wings served as rudimentary front legs while their smaller legs kept them up. Their necks and bodies were feathered, some of them in bright colors and others in brown and white. Their beaks were longer than we were tall and wide enough to swallow us whole, just like they did to Rebecca and Enoch. And now with the gun fired off, they were all staring at us. Over two dozen at least, and there was no way I had enough bullets to shoot them all. Run to the ship, I yelled as I bounded down the path that I was hoping was the right one. The creatures screeched as they took to the skies and began to snatch up more of us. I, I couldn't see who was taken. At the time, I was just hoping that I wasn't the next one taken. Running down the path, I made it into the jungle where I hoped the trees would keep me safe from the screaming banshees that flew overhead. While I ran and kept running, I couldn't hear anyone else follow me. When I made it to the shore, there was only the tender boat and the distant screeches of the Quetzalcoatlus. I couldn't hear any of my men. They didn't make it. So I just took the tender boat back to the RV Mary Anning and alone, I took it back to the wormhole. I will have to wait until it's safe to go through, but I had to get away from Isle Sigma. I will never return to Primeval. I will go back to teaching children in museums about T-Rexes and Triceratops over all of this. Screw the money! Conclusion. Primeval is full of new creatures, but it's insanely dangerous. We specifically chose Isle Sigma because it was the only island in the isolated dinosaur archipelago that didn't have large predators, only for large predators to migrate there for nesting. I still have the samples of teeth and jellyfish. We have to abide by the League of Nations mandates for our own safety. The resources here are too dangerous to harvest. Signed, Project Lead of Ida Project, codenamed Levi. Analysis of data. The MSU has concluded that the benefits of primeval still outweigh the costs. The profit from the teeth samples alone outweighs the cost of the entire expedition, even with the unfortunate casualties. Survey data has also proven that valuable sources of fossil fuel exist within Ida on primeval and investors have increased capital for the MSU to explore primeval. Report's conclusion. The full journal entries of Levi have been distributed to all scientific groups allied with, neutral, or, antag or antagonistic 
to the Mad Scientist Union. Specialists from numerous fields have asked to be on future expeditions. Refine experiment. For the next expedition, mercenaries from the Hunters Guild have been approved to protect the expeditions. Special preference will be placed on mercenaries who have experience with large predators from primeval. The next expedition to Isle Sigma will be sent with excavation equipment for surface coal mining. Replicating experiment. Three new expeditions have been approved to Primeval with special research lead, Levi leading all of the expeditions.